So let's start to discuss ESG in private markets. I'm very happy to moderate this panel and I would like to ask Christoph uh, to start with us. And basically you are a legal scholar uh, and a governance expert. And I would like to ask you, can you break the ice? Can you tell us about the normative framework of ESG in public, but maybe also in private markets? And specifically, I would like to ask you whether you consider ESG as a mandatory activity of firms, asset managers, GPs, or whether you believe this is something that has a more voluntary character to be considered. Please, Christoph. Thank you, Pascal. Um, yeah, your question has several dimensions. Uh, often, but not always, there will be mandatory issues at stake. Uh, there are still a number of more voluntary possibilities there too. Now, the different dimensions, I'll differentiate between, on the one hand side, in the investors, uh, like asset managers and so on, and the investees, the companies in which they are investing, um, and take on board at the same time also the reporting or content criteria. There are other ones, uh, maybe later onwards we will dive into some of the details of that one. Uh, you can also differentiate between the E of environment, the social issues, the governance issues, and so on. So there are different levels. Now. The first level, the investees. There is very important EU legislation. To a large extent, it's about reporting. Uh, the most important one, I would say, is currently the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which is the follow-up of the Non-Financial Disclosure Directive of 2014. And at the end of June this year, 2022, there is an agreement at the institutions level, so the Council and the, the, the Commission and so on, to have uh, this now uh, in its final stage. So we expect it to be published pretty soon, this Corporate Sustainability uh, Reporting Directive. Now, it contains detailed reporting requirements, like, for instance, something that became famous since the case of Shell uh, last year here in the Netherlands on reporting that needs to take place on scope one, scope two, scope three, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Scope one about the direct reduction, the indirect reduction is of purchased goods and services of investees is the second one and the third one even. What you sell in the market, what will it cause as uh, gas emissions? But also it contains reporting requirements with respect to pollution, human rights, equal treatment, working conditions and so on. So the full ESG elements are there. The scope, and that's an important one. Previously, it was more or less stock exchange, large stock exchange listed companies. Now, the new one, so the, this CSRD, will in fact take on board all large undertakings. Large means, and there are a number of criteria, of which an important one is employing more than 250 people. But there is also the turnover, like 40 million um, euro or assets criterion also, and you have to pass two of them. Also, some listed small and medium-sized enterprises are taken on board, and there are even, and we can discuss this later onwards, extraterritoriality elements. So outside the European Union, that's something that started since Sir Baines Oxley, more or less, that in fact also we try to include some things that are outside the region for which we issue legislation. Second, there are also, which I will not develop, very specific already mandatory rules, regulations for specific industries, like a 2017 regulation specifically addressing uh, supply chain due diligence requirements, for instance, or for companies in the mining industry, for tin, tantalum, tungsten, ores, and so on and so forth. Very specific one for very specific um, industries. The third one, and that's still a proposal, but it's a major one, and it will be heavily discussed. In February 2022, the Commission issued a Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive proposal. And that will force, again, large companies, so it goes one time, one time again, much further than stock exchange listed companies, also for large companies, to take measures uh, for the protection of human rights, and environmental adverse impacts need to be studied also once more, and you need to come up with solutions for that. Uh, to the extent, for instance, that variable remuneration packages uh, for top executives should take these elements on board explicitly, and you should report on these issues too. So that's one for the near future that we might expect. It's still a proposal, will be heavily debated. 
The second level is on the level of the investors, meaning that will be insurance companies, uh, alternative investment funds, and so on. And of course, some of these investors, like insurance companies, could be at the same time also be investees, uh, stock exchange listed insurance companies. Here also, there are a number of important rules that are mandatory to be taken on board. Since 2019, you have a sustainability-related disclosure in the financial sector regulation, the so-called 2019-2088, that is supplemented by the taxonomy regulation. And probably many of you have heard about it because it was heavily debated a couple of months ago to what extent uh, nuclear energy could be considered still as green and environmentally uh, safe and so on. The scope is here, the financial market participants, insurance companies, pension fund institutions, investment firms, alternative investment fund managers, managers of venture capital funds that, um, that are registered and so on. So quite a substantial large amount of investors. Now, it refers to financial products. Uh, but in fact, it contains also behavior indirectly. And one of the interesting features is that in there, there is the development of what they call the so-called number six, article six covered funds, article eight covered funds, article nine covered funds, meaning funds that are integrating no specific kind of sustainability issues. That is article six funds. Article eight funds are these environmentally and socially promoting funds. So these financial products promote, among other characteristics, also the environment and social characteristics. That's it. These are the green funds. And then you have the dark green funds in Article 9. These are the products that target sustainable investment specifically. So the financial product has sustainable investment as its objective. Yeah. Now, herefore, also, more information needs to be disclosed then. And you find that also in the taxonomy regulation, further criteria for screening the activities, whether or not they can be then classified as sustainable activities. And this is then on another layer by the European Commission also via delegated regulations further developed. Um, and with, on top of that, very specific what they call RTS, um, so regulatory technical standards regulation, even for the reporting requirements further developed. One that has been published relatively recently in July is one on the reporting on the financial products of April 2022. Um, it's a 70-pager document with many templates that need to be complied with mandatorily from 2023 onwards about how sustainable you are effectively when you put into the market your financial products. It's in a nutshell. Yeah, I'll be honest with you, Pascal, but I don't want to, as I'm a lawyer, if you give me an hour, I'll continue for an hour. But one final remark is, on top of that, there are still voluntary frameworks too. Like, for instance, you have green bond principles of June 21 of the ICMA, International County Management Association, that also is, in fact, more or less a label that you can adhere to in order to be qualified by them also as having green bonds in the market. And there are more of these voluntary things, but we move more and more to mandatory requirements, both for products as well as for the reporting issues. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. I think that was uh, in a nutshell, but it looks like a, a big nutshell. <laughs> um, thanks. So you mentioned those mandatory rules on the investee and investor level. I wanted to just to ask one question. So are these rules specifically and only for listed companies? So for example, for listed insurance uh, uh, groups or companies, or do these also apply to, for example, non-listed GPs or asset managers of private market funds? Yeah. So for investees, it will be in the future for all large companies and a number of other ones. So non-listed, both as listed. For the investors, it's a relatively broad. So it's not only the listed insurance companies. No, no, it's, it's a long list like pension fund, all pension fund institutions, investment firms, and so on. The criterion is whether or not you put financial product in the market. So in fact, all of them. There are some exceptions, like, for instance, you have the venture capitalists. They are um, considered the managers of them, but the registered ones. And it will bring us to too many details to say exactly when you're, you need, do you need to be registered and so on. But let's say it includes approximately all 
important players also on the private market from the level of the invest investors yes it's not only the listed ones okay we have a first question so i'm, I'm requested to uh, ask you because this seems to be very interesting so it comes from a pe fund manager and he says it's kind of distracting him is it not possible that ipef that's basically the organization that manages uh, um participants in the private markets just come up with a nice simple template so I can't forget all about it. So have you heard of IPEF issuing any recommendations in the field of ESG? Yeah, um, I don't know the work of IPEF so far. I hope that they mm. can be helpful, but strictly speaking, I'm afraid they can't do a lot. The reason is that the European Commission via delegated regulations is providing in many templates that are very detailed. What then IPEF can do is further clarify what is in there. But there is absolutely approximately no freedom in the European Union to do whatever of voluntary things to help uh, people on. So I'm afraid that the answer is to a large extent, uh, no, they can't do a lot. It's okay. all mandatory. Okay, so thank you, Christoph, for this nice introduction. I would like to ask Philippe then if we hear that most of those rules are going to be mandatory, typically mandatory legal rules will translate into some accounting rules can you maybe shed some light on on the accounting frameworks and would you think that like sarbanes oxley for example 20 years ago which has become a very uh, fast adoption of new rules in the market do, do you imagine something like that in, in the private market space or the public market space when it comes to esg philippe uh, yeah, thanks, Pascal. Uh, I'll keep it a little bit shorter than uh, Christoph. <laughs> but um, so indeed, uh, Christoph actually explained that, uh, I mean, you have the two sides and the investees and the investors. And uh, there are sustainable reporting issues uh, related to both uh, parties. And uh, when we look at the whole evolution right now, uh, it seems to be going extremely fast uh, in uh, the standards um, world. Yeah. Uh, we've seen a similar evolution for international accounting rules like more than 20 years ago, uh, when uh, first things were made on a voluntary basis, uh, then uh, there was more and more demand. And at some point, in Europe, for example, the European Parliament decided in the year 2000, uh, okay, let's actually mandate all these international financial reporting rules to all the European companies, yeah? uh, because it, it has many advantages over all the information we are requiring uh, at, at that moment. That's currently what we actually see with uh, these, sustainable, uh, these sustainability standards as well. Um, when you look at the landscape right now, and Christoph, you described um, predominantly the, the European framework, but, but in terms of reporting, uh, looking at the investees uh, side, uh, you see many, many different uh, frameworks that companies can use for showing their sustainable, uh, their emissions, uh, all, all kinds of sustainability issues, also on the social components. Um, and what we currently see is that there is some consolidation going on, and it's going in a very uh, rapid way. And there was an um, international standard setting body created uh, that only focuses on uh, sustainability uh, reporting, uh, the ISSB, it's part of the IFRS Foundation. And this is a very interesting evolution here, because um, sustainability is now considered as an equal part next to the regular accounting standards. So we are all familiar with uh, the financial uh, reporting and, and we all know what revenues mean and what specific costs mean. Uh, and this is actually now kind of the evolution in uh, the sustainability standards as well, kind of uh, standardized this uh, across the world. So th this is brand new, okay? So this is a new, uh, the, the first two standards were issued uh, a few months ago, at least the concepts. Um, 
and the whole idea is to to make it more comparable uh, more verifiable and uh, more consistent actually across companies so uh, so that's that's one thing it will help the investors definitely making uh, choices based on esg criteria uh, and that's the the whole thing so what, what we've seen in the last few years is that there is a huge demand for these sustainability standards like standardize the whole framework uh, when you read the financial press uh, the articles in the last five years, uh, there were cries for more standardization because it's it's really like an alphabet zoo. It's it, it's all kind of uh, a bit confusing. It's not comparable and so on. So from the investor side, there is definitely a large demand. Uh, but here comes the interesting uh, element. Uh, in Europe, the whole sustainability reporting movement is part of the whole European framework of the Green Deal, meaning that sustainability reporting standards will help make more transparency uh, be an element of changing the behavior of corporates and making them more competitive, more innovative, and, and also contributing to a better world. This is actually very different from other parts in the world where sustainability is more seen as a way to help investors, not so much uh, changing the behavior of the corporates themselves. Uh, and this is, for me, kind of quite interesting because the European governments will use all these uh, standards to kind of uh, determine their policies to to uh, maybe have new taxes and these types of things. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's uh, different perspectives of uh, standard setting. Uh, but uh, maybe one last element, um, uh, we are now kind of leaving the era of voluntary standards. Um, also in the United States, uh, there was, uh, again, a revolution in sustainability reporting there. The SEC uh, proposed or currently proposed like a, a new uh, climate uh, disclosure statement. And uh, again, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting to see how it evolves quite rapidly. Yeah. So, um, so we will move to more mandatory uh, reporting standards and that will help uh, both the investees and investors kind of to find each other and, and uh, to have the, the right capital allocation. Okay, so we could say rapid move towards mandatory reporting standards. So that's the translation of what we know yep. from the regulatory or legal framework into accounting. So then I would like to ask uh, Ludovic, uh, given that he specializes in private market investments and, and fee tracking, interest alignment and benchmarking, do you see anything of this already translating into the private market industry? So given that you work uh, a lot together or research private equity and on the, on the private market vehicles, can you already recognize that this is recognized by the GPs or the funds? Or what, how do you look at this from a finance standpoint of view? You must unmute your microphone. <laughs> yeah. um, so we, we already see, uh... Um, in Europe, uh, a number of funds that, that go for like Article 8 and all of these things that were mentioned before. Um, the, the, the usual worry, um, to be a number of them, but, but, but one is that the people who do not have a very good track record then use this as, as a way to say, but, but you know, we, we, are, uh, we are ESG uh, we are things. So, so for example, you have funds that are like in infrastructure space, that usually do not have as good returns as uh, LBO funds and the like. And they all play that card of saying, oh, but um, infrastructure is like uh, what is necessary for society. We, uh, we have a very, lots of positive externalities on society, et cetera, even though uh, maybe uh, they are putting you know, uh, tons of uh, roads everywhere that are highly polluting, et cetera, right? They say, oh, it's infrastructure, it is uh, you know, an airport, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and so they, they, they file for saying, look, we, we have this ESG objective and so on. And so our returns are not so good, but, but you know, it's because we have this, uh, this other objective, so we do, we do well. You see absolutely every single private equity fund raised in any emerging market that will be sold as a sustainability thing. We all say, you know, we are an impact fund, in fact, they say, um, which is quite naughty because the word impact actually does have a definition and like ESG and the like. 
Um, so the, 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 any asset manager that is like an emerging market will play the impact card. They'll say, oh, we are an impact fund. And, and, and usually emerging market private equity hasn't done as well as, as, as private equity in the US and in Western Europe. And so they will play that card uh, systematically. So, so you will have a lot of, 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 of that. Um, and, it's, and it's mainly like per geography, like any funds in emerging markets and, and per investment types, so like infrastructure or, or things like that, they will play that card systematically. And then more and more, we see some other funds that are just like normal LBOs, like a KKR and, and people like that saying, ah, oh, we also, uh, we have impact funds. Okay. And what they mean, in fact, is that they're just taking them, they do, they, they do their, their investments as usual, but they split them into two groups as a function of the industry that the investment belongs to. So for example, if you have an investment in healthcare and you say, ah, healthcare is uh, SDG objective number uh, five. Uh, so it's SDG and therefore it's uh, impact. Uh, and if I invest in agriculture, agriculture is food, food is uh, SDG number uh, blah. And so um, that's also impact. And so they're just gonna sort their industries between the ones that are linked roughly to an SDG and, and, and the ones that are not. And all the ones that fall into uh, SDG, whatever, then this is an impact fund and then the other ones are not. But of course they say the returns are not, uh, not affected. And of course they are not because they, all you're doing is like an, an investment as usual, like, except it's one industry versus another one. There's absolutely no reason to expect a, a different return. You're just packaging things in a way that you uh, can cater to an investor that says, uh, I have for my good conscience, I would like to say that I'm investing in an impact fund, but I, would not, I wouldn't want to lose returns. Say, ah, yeah, here is a bag. I've invested only in companies that are in healthcare and all these things. So it's a feel good bag. Okay. So, so, so you should be cool with that. And we see some funds that like, you know, like some things that are a bit funny, like you, you see some funds that are like a healthcare specialist. And so then they say, we're an impact fund, we invest in healthcare. And they would have portfolio companies like uh, cosmetic surgery, for example, right? So, so we, could, uh, we could argue that maybe cosmetic surgery is, uh, is, uh, is a positive uh, ESG thing or whatever that means, but it's not completely obvious. Um, so, so what we what we see is 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 this massive window dressing, which I think the the, the, the the European Union is trying to get a bit serious about and say, okay, if you want to be really Article Nine, you, you have a few more things you need to do. The SEC is also a bit stepping in, saying, okay, you cannot just you know have a portfolio of healthcare related companies and say that your impact. And, but it's still extremely timid. I mean, it's, it's 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 a lot of window dressing. The same thing as these green bonds and purple bonds and so on. It's like you. You have a government in the past would raise money for just its general budget. And now the government is saying, if part of my budget that is for the environmental uh, spending, then it's going to be a green bond. And the part of the budget that is for education, I'm going to issue a purple bond. And then for uh, the part of the budget that's going to be issued for hospitals, is also maybe a purple bond. And so, so it's a lot of just like labeling and, and feel good type of thing, but it's just like absolutely uh, uh, cosmetic. Um, and the problem with that is that you, you do have some people, it, if you're serious about having positive impact on society and really changing the world, um, public markets is not really the, the right place because in public markets, you, you, you are simply buying the, 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 the stake of someone else. You, have a, you don't have control on the company. You, you, it's a secondary market. So you, you, you know, if, you, if you sell sh shares in, in Shell, somebody is buying them. And so you, you're not changing anything if you're, selling, uh, if you're not holding uh, shares in Shell. But if you are really serious about impact, private markets is where you, you have control of a company and, 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 you, um, and you can have the, the, the opportunity to do primary investments. If you are a growth fund, for example, and if you are venture capital funds, if you are these kind of funds, you're making primary investments, like you, you're injecting money into companies. If you're doing leverage buyout, by the way, you're not, you're in a secondary transaction. You're just buying the company from someone else. So you haven't invested in the company. You just took the shareholdership from someone else. But so if you're a growth capital, if you are like venture capital, et cetera, you are, you're a primary investor and, and you, you, you have control of the company. So there you can, you can have an impact. And some people are in that space and say, look, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I can change the companies and, 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 and I do so, et cetera. But these people are a bit crowded out because if you're really um, in, in impact, meaning you really bring additionality, as I explained in, in, in my book, I have a chapter on that and I also have a, a video on YouTube where I try to explain that. If you, have, if you are going to have additionality, you have to have had a concessionary return. And so you would not be able to offer the same rate of return as others. And so the people who are doing really impact in private markets, they exist, but they tend to be crowded out by the fake uh, impact guys. 
um, and that creates a lot of problems. So, so yes, this question is central to private markets. And if anything, it's more relevant in private markets, right? Like ESG in public equity, like I, I already we don't know what ESG means, but in public equity, it's like, what can you do anyway? Like, what, what, you know, if you say, oh, you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a mutual fund that invests only in shares of healthcare companies and the like. So what? Like, you, you sold the shares to someone else, or you bought them from someone else. Like, what, you're not changing anything. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's it's central in prime markets. A lot is going on. Uh, it's also going pretty fast. Uh, but uh, we are fighting quite a lot of BS on those fronts as well. Excellent. Thank you. So, so you're. Uh drawing my attention exactly to two very important questions I wanted to ask. So, but since you're already there, I think we jump into that uh, right away. Um, you put something nicely or halfway polite, uh, which I would say is the next lemons coming down at the market. So there might be a huge conflict of interest um, between asset managers that pretend to be green. It's also called greenwashing. Uh, in a way that investors accept a lower return. So as we know, there is non-pecuniary utility, as economists call it, or in simple terms, green assets or impact funds need to display a lower return. Um, so the question is uh, the chicken and the egg. If, if funds that have a low return and then do as if they were green to just uh, either make funds flow to their vehicles or keep their investors, I think there is a huge um, conflict of interest or agency problem that we can observe in that market. That, that leads us to at least two observations, I think. Uh, one is then how can we really measure ESG? Is it a disclosure thing? Is it just disclosing documents and elements? And I wanted to ask Philippe about that because I'm uh, co-authoring a paper with Philippe and another colleague on this topic. And I know we have some interesting uh, preliminary and, and not yet uh, finished results, but this will be interesting to, to listen to you, Philip. So, so do you think there is potential conflicts of interest? Do we, do we see anything in the private market data that you think is uh, worth mentioning at this place? And then also, uh, of course, we have a, a big divergence in, in ESG ratings. So are these ESG ratings anyhow usable or not usable uh, to measure ESG, what is it that we measure? Is it really just disclosing paper or is it anything that has to do with ESG uh, performance? So it's like two separate questions. But one would be, um, I can also ask Ludovic because it's like responding to his statements. Do, do you agree that we might have a huge information asymmetry problem or at least a conflict of interest in the space of you know, being green, knowing investors have a non-pecuniary utility, allowing those funds to do as if they were green, to keep the money, to make the money flow to their funds without really being green. Is that, do, do I translate you correctly or have I missed you? Yeah, yeah, you could, you could say it this way. Okay, thank you. Philip, what are your reactions to that? We have looked at the interesting data set. And right, right, right. Um, I can say a few things about this. And also your second question is also a question in the, in the chat by uh, Gavin on the ESG ratings. And are, are they useful kind of, uh, I mean, it's somehow related. Um, so we, we use in this uh, current uh, research project uh, that we are doing, uh, the Prekin data that um, labels uh, or rates all the funds, the GPs and also the LPs as um, on the dimension of uh, ESG. So they have the, the E, the S and the G, uh, and they also have it at different levels, at the firm level, uh, the fund level, and actually the, the, the asset level. Okay, so the portfolio company. So it's interesting to kind of make a few observations here. Uh, like what we see when we look at these uh, thousands of funds, uh, the GPs are... Um, the level of ESG transparency based on that rating by Prekin is actually very low, really low, like uh, on, on all the dimensions. And the best measure uh, is actually at the firm level. So like general policies and ESG policies and uh, more governance related uh, things like uh, what, what they have been doing actually before uh, many people started talking about uh, sustainability um, per se. 
so, so they seem to report these types of elements, but uh, uh, way less actually on, on other dimensions that go into the environmental issues and the social issues. Um, now, there are big differences across funds. Okay, so of course, some of these PE funds are like KKR, uh, are listed companies. And of course, they need to uh, fulfill all the requirements by the SEC. Okay, so there you have many more uh, disclosures and, and uh, also the these ESG scores are, are quite higher. But we see like a, a huge difference between Europe, European funds on ESG dimension and the rest of the world. Uh, actually, the US is, uh, is pretty bad uh, on all the dimensions that Precken is is uh, measuring uh, so so then in our project we are asking the question so why is this okay and it relates back to what christoph actually also said in the beginning uh, so if you are a pe fund in, in europe you have lots of information uh, because you have disclosures on private companies yeah? so that makes it a little bit easier and and that has been uh, in europe uh the case for for many decades uh but also now the, the the new legislation is kind of covering a lot of private companies in fact uh there will be fifty thousand companies covered uh on sustainability reporting uh including the smes and these types of things so it's a huge set of companies that are kind of uh can be used and this transparency can be used by these pe funds uh so that this whole transition um that, that we see of uh, more transparency on, on sustainability in these funds is really driven by European funds. Okay, so uh, traditionally it has been uh, the case that there is more transparency of the companies they invest in, uh, but also now the, the, the whole legislation in Europe is, is, is a driving force for, for this transparency. Um, now, the rating agencies and uh, so Precken is of course rating these these funds okay but if we look and I think one of the the questions in the in the chat and also your question Pascal is uh, what about these some often confusing ratings that you see okay uh, Tesla can be rated by one rating as a real green company and by another company as, as a uh, like a gray company or, or black company. Okay, so why do we have these uh, uh, differences? And, and uh, I mean, it, there are some interesting um, papers uh, recently published on this. Uh, some colleagues at uh, MIT basically looked into the different ratings that exist on ESG. And they, they notice actually that the dimensions they measure, the scope of the E, the S and the G, like all the different elements are vastly different between all these ratings. Yeah? Again, Precken looking at private equity and private debt funds, I mean, they, they choose 37 dimensions, but why not 50 dimensions or, or 60 dimensions. I mean, there, there could be more. Okay, so it's, it's an arbitrary choice between these ratings. So th this seems to be like a very important determinant, the scope of the different measures on E, the S and the G. But then also, once you choose something like, let, let's uh, say, okay, uh, gender diversity. Okay, so they all agree, okay, gender diversity is important but you have different measurements of gender diversity so you can have uh, the pay gap differences at the top executive level or in the company or uh, you can uh, do accounts of uh, male versus female at different levels so you have all different measures and that seems to be driving a lot of these uh, this divergence between these uh, these ratings and finally of course uh, the the weights they put on the e the s and the g components uh, to aggregate everything i mean i can find for example human rights to be very important whereas uh, another rating might uh, have like more weight on the environment for example so that's that's uh, and uh, so so here is my prediction um it's always a little bit risky to make a prediction, but uh, um, given that we have 
way more disclosures uh, also on things that Ludovic actually said about the impacts that, that you claim to have. Okay, and there is a lot of greenwashing going on right now, but given that you have the EU taxonomy in Europe that every single activity needs to be kind of uh, shown uh, to contribute or not contribute to uh, the, the environmental transition yeah, or, or the sustainable transition. So given that you have way better measurements uh, in the coming years um, that are certified as well, yeah, so there is assurance uh, on top of that, I predict basically that these ESG ratings will actually get closer to each other because you will automatically see that these measures used by companies will converge anyway because they become more comparable. And that's what we've seen actually in the financial uh, reporting world as well. Uh, if there is confusion, for example, um, about how to measure revenues, okay, the top line in the income statements, well, then rating agencies may actually uh, diverge simply because they have different interpretations of what uh, revenues are. Now, we have all kinds of standards that, that make it much, much more clear actually what, what, how you should measure uh, revenues. Well, the same thing will happen actually to all the sustainability items. And, and, uh, but give it a few years. I mean, uh, things typically in the, the financial reporting space take uh, 10, 15 years actually to converge uh, towards like high quality type of information. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we need to give it a few years to actually get sustainable information and impact information to be, which is way more tricky actually than financial information uh, to, to measure, um, to, to actually be of high quality. Okay, thank, thank you, Philip. I want to come back to uh, what you said before. So you said that uh, the sustainability reporting standards have somehow this target of uh, having a causal relationship between transparency and ESG suitable behavior, let's call it like this, or sustainability behavior. So I wanted to ask Christoph first um, whether he sees that in, in the coming uh, legislation, whether there is any link uh, in the laws that we see, but also I wanted to ask Ludovic. Um, I mean, there are at least three levels that we need to look at in private market. One is the GP, so the asset manager. The second is the fund itself, and then the most important one, most probably, would be the composition of a private market portfolio. What so? What do these GPs select as an investment, and how do these underlying investments behave in terms of ESG? So, what we see in this study we're, we're currently conducting that there are large differences. Um, so, what would we need to do, in your opinion, to 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 connect transparency? And behavior. So, what dimensions should we be transparent? And and this goes back, of course, to the rating uh, discussion. But let's ask Christoph maybe first. And uh, do you see any of these concrete measures coming up in in legislation, or is it more like, as long as you report something, everybody is happy? No, 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 no. I don't think so. Um, a number of issues. Yeah. First of all, what um, an important one is that more and more in this new legislation, there will have to be also some assurance provided. Um, so it is either sometimes a statutory auditor, but, but some of these rules, it, it opens the door. I didn't understand how come that the statutory auditors didn't lobby more, that it will even be uh, possible for independent assurance service providers. So maybe probably these, um, these auditors will set up subsidiaries that take care of it. Um, so there will be a more rigid control taking place. That's the first element I want to say. Second thing is what you definitely see is that according to the economic activity, uh, more specific rules are being issued that both for reporting as well as for production itself uh, will harmonize to a certain extent what you need to comply with for. That will more than likely indeed result if that, that these rating agencies will have to make use um, of these disclosed information related standards to assess the quality of either the products, either um, the companies, um, so to, to have their rating um, elaborated. So there will be some kind of harmonization, but it will take a long period of time, as Philip is, is pointing at, it will, it will need some time. 
hopefully, we strictly speaking, end up um, with creating superfluous ratings for, in particularly, several of these levels, with the exception of the investees. Because if you think about it, um, if, if, if I'm an investor, ultimately, I'm, I'm, I'm an investor trying to get some return. So if you create product requirements that we see, for instance, for making cars, they should not have certain types of emissions above certain standards anymore. And production requirements at the level of the investees, it shouldn't make that much of a difference anymore in which you are investing so to become, because they all should be more or less green or green enough what we finally uh, want to reach out for. Now, this is a long-term evolution. So in the meantime, um, there will be, I hope, some coordination taking place. Um, I'm a little bit afraid also, I have to say, Pascal, because we all know that at several levels, they do not necessarily, even at the European Commission, they do not necessarily closely work together. It will take time, but the market will go in that direction, as Philip is also pointing at. Okay, so you're saying legislation is going to be concrete enough uh, to at least construct rules, a rule-based book, so to speak, and translate that into, into the real business life. And Ludovic, if you look at, at those questions, the disconnection between transparency and behavior, do you, do you think, uh, as from what we see now, that ESG and some transparency on ESG is really affecting behavior of GPs substantially or not at all? And then if you I could see it. elaborate the, on that. The only empirical evidence I have is that I, I have a paper where we look at employee satisfaction in, uh, in private equity. Uh, you can look at which uh, GP is, is controlling these companies. And you can look at pre-queen data that we mentioned earlier on the ESG rating by pre-queen of these GPs. There's absolutely no correlation between how they treat their employees uh, in the underlying companies and what ESG is reported in pre-queen. Um, the, the, the issue is that like ESG is just like, do you feel that this company is nice or not, right? So every single individual will have a different score, okay? So I have bad news and good news, okay? Being French, I start with the bad one, okay? Bad news is you will, you will never have like a clear rating of ESG and, and the like, because like everybody will feel differently, right? So is, para, is a company that makes paracetamol uh, an ESG, uh, uh, pos, a good ESG company? Let's say, well, paracetamol uh, makes people uh, headaches go away. So apparently it's okay. Sometimes it kills people, but uh, we, we forgive them. And so yes, uh, paracetamol, uh, positive ESG. Okay. Is a company that makes cannabis positive ESG? Uh, yes, it's, it's green. It's like, it's a plant. Uh, it's a natural. Uh, it, maybe you can be an organic cannabis, right? You, can, you could uh, not use any chemical for, uh, to grow your cannabis. Um, and it helps some people with headaches. It uh, does uh, make some people feel, uh, feel less pain, uh, but it does get some more people killed than paracetamol. So I'm not sure. Maybe I would put it in positive ESG and somebody wouldn't, right? Say, so, okay. How about somebody makes cannabis? Some people like it, right? So is that positive ESG or like, well, maybe it kills a bit too many people. And so this is negative ESG, right? So everybody will put the, the, the gradient somewhere else. And so that's the bad news. You will never have a, a clear ESG rating. The good news is that you don't care. It, it makes no difference. Whether a company is feel good or doesn't feel good, doesn't matter. Because if, if you buy a share in a cannabis company, somebody is selling it to you, you haven't changed anything, right? So it, it doesn't matter which stock you buy or don't buy, you know, they, like you don't change anything. So what, so if we go, then, then it solves the question of, can we measure ESG? It's like, yeah, there's no point in even trying and you don't even care, so that's, that's fine. So now mo what most people mean when they talk about ESG and so on is that they, they mean additionality, like helping the world, like making the world a better place. That's what we call additionality. Now that concept is well defined. This concept means you are improving a situation by your intervention and without this intervention, things wouldn't have happened that way, right? So this, this situation wouldn't have been, uh, you wouldn't have a guy who came up with like a, a lead free paint if you hadn't invested in that company and, and, and made it happen. Okay, so then you have a positive impact, you have additionality. And now that we know how to measure it, we can measure it by random control experiments you can, you, in, in, in many cases. We can say, you know, we, we treat some employees and uh, some companies and, some, and not over. So we take a situation where we treat one set of, of people, not the other, and we see if it makes a difference, right? Um, so additionality often can be measured. 
but people don't bother to measure additionality because they don't have to. They can just like write a text saying, you know, I'm a nice person. I've I've put uh, a lot of women on uh, on on uh, on the board or not, or you know, like you go, you cannot, you will always come up with a story that says, look, I'm I'm a nice company. So, so we know how to measure uh, uh, additionality uh, in 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 many situations, and I think that's what people should be focusing on, um, trying to uh, see whether a company feels good or bad. Pointless. Okay, okay. Did I interrupt you? You wanted to continue? No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. no. Okay, thank you. So, well, okay. So you mentioned um, you mentioned that. I don't know whether I got that correctly, but you said whether you buy or don't buy a stock, it doesn't really matter. So you're somehow coming to the point where we, or I would like to discuss the question of if if you're an investor and you want to impact ESG performance, let's say we will be measuring uh, CO2 emissions. So if this was an accepted measure of how we look at sustainability, which is one of many potential measures, but it could be a good one. Um, how would you want to, or how could you impact actually the behavior of private market participants? I have a question. Are you asking me? Well, I'm asking the three of you, but okay. uh, you you can respond the first if you like. So, um, you, one you, one you proposal. Some, yeah. Can I just read from uh, a mail I received? So one proposal, for example, is why don't we put sustainability KPIs into the debt package? So I would I would uh, translate that into. The contractual at the contractual level from an investor to an investee. Why don't we put KPIs on contracts that concretely measure ESG outcomes, such as, for example, CO2 emissions, if we want to affect how people act um, in relate in relation to ESG? Ludo. So this is happening. So so and and, and this would be an, a good example of where you can do something very concrete. You can say, look, I'm. I want to lend directly or by an intermediary, and this intermediary says, uh, "I will lend." For, do you accept that instead of lending at four percent uh, to someone, I would lend at three point five percent if we re we ask this person to reduce uh, their green gas emission by more than a certain amount? Now you need to make sure that these people were it, they were not on the way to do it anyway, and then they just enjoy the, the lower interest rate. That, that you really make sure that this was really additional; it wouldn't have happened without you and giving a lower interest rate. Um, and so you, if, if you do these sorts of things, you're intervening on the, on the primary market, you are, or you, 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 you're giving a concessionary return, you say, you know, I will obtain only 3.5% on the money I lend instead of four, but uh, I, I reduce green gas emissions. So that, that's exactly what I'm talking about. We, here, you, it's concrete, you can measure it, you have additionality, uh, you have accepted a concessionary return for it, and everything is clear. And so you can take other examples, you could say, look, uh, if you want uh, to have buildings that are more energy efficient, then you, when you build, you make them more energy efficient and will cost you a bit more money, but that's what you do. Now, you need to always be careful though when, you, when you're playing with other people's money, right? So it's pretty easy in the, in the Netherlands for a pension fund to say, I'm, I'm going to build all these buildings uh, um, green and energy efficient, et cetera, but that's the pensioner's money that you're putting, uh, that you're spending extra to, to, to make the building green. So you, you have here a bit of a more moral issue to, to struggle because it's quite nice to uh, to be nice with other people's money, right? So uh, I'm very happy to be a Mr. Hero and building only green buildings, but other people are paying for the cost, right? So, um, but so that's in a nutshell what I would um, answer uh, the question. So would would you agree with the statement that that says that investor engagement, as we see it in some in some research related to public market companies, works? also in private markets so would you say lps have an impact on the esg related behavior of gps in, in, in principle as... an lp actually loses i mean i don't want to talk too much in front of a lawyer about that but an lp loses his limited limited partner status if he's intervening or influencing the gp's behavior right so so you need to be very careful with that so in principle i mean it can be written in the limited partnership agreement that, that the gp will uh, behave in a certain way etc but the lp cannot uh, when the, the, the partnership is running, I cannot say I would like you to do this and not that. Um, so, so, but but in in practice, LPs influence uh, things a little bit, but also LPs are not playing with their money, right? So LPs are agents, uh, so uh, they have the same problem, right? Again, uh, you have a Dutch pension fund can be in KKR and put pressure on KKR, but it's not their money. Uh, so, how would you react, Christoph? So, so Ludo says, I think rightfully, LPs may not interfere too much as they lose their independence and then might be uh, held responsible in, in a legal in a legal uh, dimension. 
Yep. But you could also negotiate that ex ante, right? So you could have a clear picture on what is done and not done on the portfolio level and negotiate that ex ante. Or what is your general reaction to how can you actually impact the GP's behavior in private markets from a theoretical standpoint of view? Um, I, think so. I think that to a large extent I agree. Um, in a way, but then from another perspective, if you and you, he mentioned already, for instance, yeah, but if you are then investing, for instance, in, in building a bridge and you get private finance, okay, but strictly speaking, and that's where it boils down, is um, politics and law comes into play, sorry to say, that is you have to have certain standards that you need to comply with to build a bridge. And eventually then in a private partnership you can then build in some before we provide you extra money the gp can we can build in a contract that it needs to have higher standards fine and there it stops somewhere because otherwise sorry to say but actually the bottom line is whether it's a pension fund even or a gp or whatever it they they need to get some return to their beneficiaries whoever they are um, so they should not become too much involved to the extent that they are going to sit on the seat of, in fact, the company that should build the bridge, uh, whether it's direct or indirect. Now, there is more leeway than, in my opinion, also for having a more freedom for the pension funds while they're still playing with other months' money to be more actively involved than for the GP that is in fact playing with a certain amount of private money with very specific specific criteria that they should need to comply with for their beneficiaries. But the bottom line is where we, I think, go wrong currently is to um, shift almost um, in a mandatory way um, some of the requirements that you have to take on board and um, for whoever is investing requirements that um, go almost automatically next to the ultimate goal for which you effectively either as a GP have created a fund or your pension fund and so on. You, you should keep that in mind ultimately. And if you go aside that one, you lose approximately the financial markets in the idea, the whole idea. So it should be at a lower level further developed. Philippe? Yeah, well, um, as the last uh, person uh, responding to this, uh, well, I agree with uh, what uh, Ludovic and, and Christoph actually said. Um, I mean, to me, it's, it's a matter of, um, I mean, there is, is a trend that accountability of the GPs is actually going up. And, uh, when you look at um, the KKR um, annual reports, I mean, that, that's interesting to read. Um, they explicitly recognize that uh, there is increased risk of all kinds of regulations going on, the regulations that we described before, uh, and they become more and more accountable. So Christoph was referring to uh, building a bridge and so on and, and providing money to build that bridge. Well, uh, you don't want to actually end up uh, to be the GP of a bridge that collapses. And uh, what happened in the, in Genoa, like a few years ago in Italy, um, and, and this accountability is actually not only coming from uh, like governments or so, but, but uh, actually coming from uh, civil society in general, I think. Uh, and this is what you currently see in the Netherlands. Okay, so um, these pension funds invest quite sizable amount of money in, in uh, as an LP in, into these um, uh, GPs. But it's these beneficiaries that are pretty vocal and uh, often organize demonstrations in front of the headquarters. And you don't want to be in the news all the time uh, as, as a pension fund where uh, you are kind of um, accused of making bad investments, choosing the, right, the wrong partners, uh, the GPs and so on. So more and more you see actually accountability uh, of, of the GPs and the LPs and so on. And, uh, that's partly due to because of um, more transparency that, that you actually have, uh, and you'll see this more and more. Yeah. So the the you, you cannot simply claim uh, everything uh, to be green and and not be green at all, and so the the whole greenwashing because you will be at some point uh, be accountable for this. Uh, we saw this in in the DWS in Germany. Um, 
uh, last last year. Well, more and more of these things will happen, I guess. So for me, the the whole issue is on the accountability that is increasing. Okay, so so if I translate that simple question, now let's see what the answers are. Um, can we then not translate some of those standards into a performance measurement that is performance fee relevant in private markets? So we all know private market GPs receive a performance fee that's typically any return exceeding uh, some preferred returns. So would it then not be possible to say some portion of the total performance fee must be related to KPIs that are ESG related? It's maybe Ludovic's uh, topic. And that's wishful thinking, but can we do that? In, um, so economics is a very big uh, science. There are lots of economists, uh, and there, there are not that many uh, well-established facts in economics. But there is one that is extremely well-established, which is that if you pay people on multiple dimensions, pay performance with multiple dimensions, it goes wrong. In fact, it goes wrong as long as you pay somebody for one thing, and that, that person has multiple objectives, which is about the case of most people. So it always goes wrong. So if, for example, you start saying, uh, I'm going to pay university professors on uh, per publication uh, in uh, this list of journals. You will see immediately people are going to focus all of their attention on that. They're going to neglect teaching, etc. They're going to, you know, they, 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 they're going to be uh, gaming that, that metric because now they, they, they hear the signal that your pay depends on that one dimension. And so you, you spend all your time gaming that one dimension. And so the solution to, to this is, is how uh, university professors are paid, for example, and, many, and most people on the planet, which is you give a fixed salary to people and um, if they uh, underperform or overperform, they, 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 they will get a bit of a higher salary or lower salary, but overall, and not really linked to one specific metric, right? So for example, when we tenure people or promote people, we say, we're not gonna tell you how much weight we put on teaching, the research, citizenship, et cetera. You need to be kind of like uh, good on everything and we're not gonna give you numbers or... So, um, it's, it's the same thing here, right? So there's this obsession in private markets, which is uh, with uh, pay for performance. Like if I don't pay somebody, then this person is not gonna perform. I just fire it, <laughs> fire this person, okay? Um, and um, so, 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 so there is this, and this obsession, we see this with this ESG movement. Now people are saying, oh, why don't we pay people a bit for their performance? And then we pay them for having been nice to the employees or things like that. And then, ah, and how do you measure that and, and so on? You're opening like a Pandora box, okay? So that's 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 uh, terrible. But if you leave the things as they are, people are paid on a single metric, which is uh, how much money you're bringing back to the LPs, and that's that's the wrong metric. If if you as an LP, you care about uh, the impact this GP has on society and 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 the like, right? So. I think what the economics theory would say is that if you really have a GP with multiple objectives, you would like the GP to, to go beyond what is legal, right? So because that's what it is, right? The, the GP is not supposed to hire child labor and all these things, it's illegal. But you would like the GP to go beyond what is, what is legal. Um, and at the same time, to perform, then you give multiple objectives to the GP. In this case, you need to give him a flat wage. Um, you, need, you need to pay the GP a flat salary and saying, uh, exactly like we say for people when uh, they come up for tenure or promotion, we say, we, we, we're going to look at overall what you did, uh, how you made your money, uh, did you exploit some people, did you hurt some people on the way or not? And as a function of that, we will uh, give you more money for the next fund or not, and uh, that will command your next level of pay. But So that, that I think, is what uh, economics theory would say, and, so that's, and that's pretty well, uh, I think, uh, established and non-controversial. So it's very, very slippery road and very dangerous road. And we have tons of empirical studies showing that it always goes wrong in a company when people have multiple objectives to start introducing a paper for, 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 paper for performance on one dimension or several dimensions. Okay, you say that that's can a I, well established. Uh, yes, Pascal, can, can I just sure. uh, ask a question to, to Ludovic? So, uh, I mean, you're definitely right on, on the, the different dimensions, but what about an impact fund? I mean, an impact fund that claims to have a specific impact where the financial performance is, is one dimension, but it, it seems to make like a big story about real non-financial impact on, on specific dimensions. Wouldn't you kind of, as an LP, kind of try to keep that fund also accountable for the impact that they claim, the non-financial impact, or 
Yeah, but why would you why would you link it to 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 a bonus payment? Like again, take a parallel with an academic, right? The university hired you because you're great professors of of law. Why are we? You know, we we, we need to have other ways to say, well, you know, you're not quite doing your your duties. You're not being a good citizen. You're not you're not you're not paying enough attention to the students when you teach, etc. We need to have like other mechanisms, right, of monitoring. Other than just I'm going to pay you a bonus if you do actually what you promised, or uh, because what what happens? I, I, I give you an example in the in in, in the to stay in education, right? So, mm-hmm. um, at one point, the U.S. government says um, we are going to we want to educate more people, especially the people that are from rough backgrounds, etc. And so what we're going to do uh, it's actually a similar system as uh, what the Dutch government does uh, with Dutch universities. We're going to give you ten thousand euros per student who graduates. Uh, from your university, right? So in Poland, if you have a master's degree, right, a per person who actually gives their thesis back and, and, and finish their study, you get 10,000. If they don't finish, like it is the case at the University of Amsterdam, there are more people not finishing their degrees at the University of Amsterdam, maybe a self-selection thing, then the University of Amsterdam is actually in trouble because they have many non-finishers, they don't get their money, and so it changes a bit the incentive. So at one point, the government says, you know, the more people you're going to educate, we're going to give you 10,000 per person that graduates, etc. So it's a good intention, right? Here you link the, the pay to an outcome. Uh, this person has got a degree and they got a certain number of educa- hours of education, et cetera. And there is a study that looks at it and then find that there are all these for-profit organizations that set up. They give these degrees to people. Yes, technically they gave them the number of hours of teaching, et cetera, but with, uh, you know, some, some people barely speaking English, et cetera, right? And these people with their degrees, they didn't get better jobs than, than the people who didn't go to this degree and had the same background, et cetera. And so all you did is that you transferred money from the, the state to private uh, entities that just said, okay, I, cre- I did education, et cetera. It, bottom line is that it's so hard to contract, even on something as simple as like, I would like you to educate a certain number of people, here is a contract. It's, you just cannot do it and pay people on a, a bonus. Uh, so I think it's, it, it has to be more like, like we do with, uh, in many, uh, space of life that like we, we do a look at the overall package we monitor and, and if we are disappointed by, by by a fund manager and we fire the fund manager and, and, and if we are happy with fund manager fund manager may get more money to be managed next time things like that um that that seems to me uh, the, the only uh, the only way okay so that's that's the economic theory approach which i uh, understand and would also support but if we if we mirror that to the reality, and you have written one paper on on GP pay, which is um, I think very critical, but also correct, of course, then we know that there are huge bonuses paid on some sort of excess performance, whatever the benchmark um, is. So, so you you're basically requesting those GPs to substantially lower their pay if we would do that, or are you proposing we we just uh, forget about uh, carried interest and performance fees, and and take some median or average uh, payment for for their decent yeah, work. Yeah, I've I've always had a difficult time to 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 believe that anyone would work any less hard if instead of paying them one hundred million, we would pay them one million. It's a, it's a it's a notion I'm struggling with. Uh, I'm not sure Bill Gates would have worked any less hard with Microsoft uh, if he would have got just a uh, hundred million instead of a hundred billion. Um, so, so yeah, but but this paper is about for-profit organizations anyway. So, so if 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 you are working to if, if you are investing in private equity to maximize your return, the way the contracts are written are roughly optimal. Like like they, they are paid as a function of how much money they bring you back. So, but if you have if you introduce the notion of multiple objectives, then this will fail. Like you cannot uh, have a carried interest on financial performance and say ah, but there was multiple objectives. That, that cannot work. Okay, so I'm opening up a new a new set of questions, which are more uh, related maybe to research. Um, and I'm wondering what you think about the many papers that we now read in uh, in very good journals. So I'm talking Journal of Finance, Journal of Financial Economics, and others. Uh, it appears that some of our research colleagues are able, in fact, to identify clear dimensions of ESG attributes on the one side, maybe ESG outcomes and performance. Uh, and they're able to link that to, to again, some, you know, causal relationships. So 
if what we said about those dimensions, they're not measurable, it's hard to identify, it's somehow vague, would be true, that would also imply that it's really very hard to produce reasonable research in the area. It seems that uh, the editors of those journals are of a different opinion. So what, what is it um, that I'm missing here? For example, I'm making an example. There is a nice study of the Journal of Financial Economics on the impact of the announcements of the big three, um, talking about BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street Global Advisors, basically said that if they lend out to corporates, or if they invest in their uh, equity mutual funds into corporates, they will take um, ESG behavior or sustainability into account when doing that. So this Journal of Financial Economics study basically says that yes, you can measure statistically significant the impacts of those three big banks, the big three. Um, so there is a causal relationship between them being invested in companies after they have announced that, and then this uh, CO2 emission performance. So, so there seem to be relationships which we can measure in fact. This is a little bit different from what we have been saying so far. I just want to open the round here. There, I can cite, I have 10, 20 papers here, which go in the same direction. Um, papers, of course, disagree as to whether ESG-oriented companies perform better or worse. So most of the papers say there is a positive relationship. Some very good papers say not measurable. Others say it's even negative. But I would say there are ways to identify and isolate attributes of firms that can be linked to some sort of outcome or ESG performance. How do we think about that from a legal accounting and finance standpoint of view? Or implicitly I'm saying it might be insufficient to say we cannot really measure it. I agree it's very hard to measure, but there is research out there. Should we not work harder to be able to measure it or is this just a fantasy? Shall, shall I say something? I don't feel very comfortable uh, in, immediately <laughs> because it's it's about corporate finance, not about law. But first of all, um, Ludo, I think, pointed out that a very good element, which is, first of all, also these journals still also publish what is um, uh, fashionable to publish. So if you can come up with a decent research, you might also have a, an incentive to publish these things. So maybe there are too many publications in that area. The second, So that's the first one. Maybe Ludovic or, or Philip disagrees, but uh, then I'll, I'll hear that. Uh, the second thing that also comes into play is that most of these studies still work with proxies. Um, yeah, so of course you have these ESG, and I saw a number of these studies, and they they, they based are based on the developments of of the rankings in ESG, and then you can you can measure it. And yeah, then you find some results. And as all these measurements are a bit different, some of them will say, hey, positive effects and others will say negative effects. So that to a large extent might explain also partially how it works. So it boils down then a little bit once more to what Ludo says, probably a number of criteria have been taken on board. And let's say in, in the US, I know that social elements and governance elements are highly emphasized. I think Philip pointed out towards that direction too. And of course, if we have a more diverse board, it scores well. And it seems to be that more diverse boards happen, I saw some studies also happen to provide in a better performance with a very tricky element, what kind of a performance have they measured? So Pascal, with all the studies, I'm still not convinced. Um, and certainly not if it is Vanguard, State Street and BlackRock because they are so huge that I can't even almost believe that they can get extraordinary benefits given to their size compared to the market. But okay, that's because I'm a lawyer and I might not fully understand how it works. Can I add something to this, Pascal? Sure. Yeah. Sure. So uh, a few years ago, the, there was a paper published uh, in Journal of Accounting and Economics uh, by Tom Lees and uh, two co-authors, and um, I mean their story is is maybe applicable to to the 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 big three, the the and and the effects. Okay. So they look at the companies investing in CSR, 
and subsequent performance. And they measure performance in terms of accounting performance, eh? like uh, growth and sales, profitability, but also uh, stock market performance. And they have different, um, uh, two different theories. So it could be that those companies investing in CSR and making these announcements that they will invest in CSR, um, that this is a simply like a great investment eh? and CSR works and therefore you will become more profitable and grow more and, and the stock market will recognize this. Okay, that's the, the what they call the investment hypothesis. So it's a great thing to do. Uh, you might believe uh, that ESG is really uh, the best uh, thing you can do and these announcements are value enhancing. Actually, they don't find this, okay? They, they don't find this. And what they do find is actually the signaling. Uh, they, they find evidence for the signaling hypothesis. So companies making these announcements and making these investments in ESG are signaling that they have private information on uh, that they will have um, a competitive advantage and that they will be profitable in the future and these types of things. And they use the signal uh, of CSR investments in the case of uh, Tom Lees and so on, or what we call ESG. And they find actually uh, significant evidence for, for that story. So again, I mean, these three institutions, when they make this kind of announcements, uh, they have all kinds of private information that they might actually try to signal actually by these uh, ESG. If this is the wave and if this is the way the world is going, again, they signal that they are ahead of many others. And therefore, uh, the market reacts to this. It's not per se the E, the S, or the G topic that is driving this, but more the signal of future profitability. OK, I have no reaction from Ludovic. Um, do you I, want to react? I can or? give you one. It's fine. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so I don't know these 20 studies. Uh, that, 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 that you're referring to, I, I, I know only one, uh, one uh, academic, uh, Alex Edmonds, but that uh, is probably uh, responsible for half of the study that you have in mind. Um, but, but that's fine, that's, that's one uh, stream of work. Uh, most of the studies I see on ESG uh, are pretty consistent with everything uh, we, we have said. So um, I see that there is my friend uh, Pedro Matos on the call, for example. Pedro has, an, has, a, has, a, has a fantastic uh, paper re recently uh, on uh, on, on, on ESG, uh, it shows that, for example, when uh, uh, people who are more climate conscious, institutional investors that are more climate conscious, uh, change their portfolios. In fact, they, they are not really engaging and forcing the companies to be more uh, carbon efficient or like uh, using less, uh, reduce their carbon emissions. But instead, they simply take companies that already have less emissions in their portfolio. They overweight these companies and then they can say, look, my portfolio has less carbon than it used to have. What does that change, right? It's, it's just like, you know, you replace one company by another, you sold it to someone else who wants you, you got rid of. So it, it doesn't change anything to anything, right? So, so to, to me, a, lo a lot of, of academic studies uh, that, that are produced are very consistent with, with uh, the fact that people respond to economic incentives. You have all kinds of studies on mutual funds that shows that uh, the mutual funds that, 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 that relabel themselves sustainability uh, or related. Uh, people who had uh, poor track records, they charge higher fees, uh, they, uh, they perform as well as others uh, going forward because nothing has changed, they just exclude some types of companies, uh, that's it. So, um, so, so I'm not quite sure that there is an overwhelming uh, evidence out there that, uh, that I have missed, but, but I would be very happy to look at the 20 yeah. papers you, you, you cited to see if there is uh, anything I've missed. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the, work, of the work of Alex Edmonds, I, I know he has a, a different take and a strong take on, on, on this issue. And that's fair enough. His, his papers are very interesting. Um, okay. But it's not completely clear uh, what the economic story is, right? So uh, and he himself uh, acknowledged that it's not completely clear on what it is. Because, you know, you have this, 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 this classic case where they say, you know, if, if companies treat their employees better, if they pay them better, et cetera, if, he, if the companies perform better, you know, like, how does that work, right? So if I double the salary of everyone, uh, uh, next year, um, okay, they will be happier. That, that I'm going to make more money. Like, how, how does that work, right? So, um, it 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 it's, it's not completely easy to understand uh, the logic of, of all these arguments. Again, I I'm sure we are towards the end of, of, of the talk. I, in my book, I have a full chapter on uh, sustainability in private markets, uh, and I have a few case studies. 
Uh, one of my case study, uh, actually the hero is here on the call. I, I saw him joining uh, late, by the way. And, um, uh, and he works in impact investing uh, in the US. And so it's, I think it's very interesting to, 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 to see uh, this case and his journey. Um, and then I have his YouTube video where I explain a bit more um, what, what I just described today, people are interested. Okay, excellent. So as Ludovic said, we are uh, coming closer to the end of the webinar. I wanted to shed light on the last topic. Uh, we have been not blaming, but somehow discussing the conflict of interest uh, of asset managers, collecting money, uh, managing fund flows, um, kind of um, signaling things to investors. However, there is mutual fund research, and I wanted to ask you the question related to mutual funds, whether we can transfer that knowledge to, to private markets, which says that basically to the question, why do investors actually hold social, socially responsible mutual funds? One of the findings, and there is again a couple of papers, one is the Journal of Finance, 2017 is for social signaling reasons, so herding, you know, being in the good club of investors that uh, pay attention to ESG or, or responsible investment. So should we also blame investors a little bit? Uh, I mean, is it true that all the investors or the majority of investors are following ESG focus because they're interested in sustainability or is this more driven by the legal framework? And if so, is this social signaling motive of investors then transferable to private markets? And if so, uh, what do you think about it? So I'm saying investors basically invest at least large portions of their motivation is driven by herding. They want to be those investors who look for the right things according to their relative peers, according to the herd and not for the outcome. Do you observe that in private markets, Ludo? The, the, the people I, I, I meet, uh, I, guess I meet a lot of people in the space of like sustainable uh, interest in, in private markets, they all mean genuinely well. They, they really all want to do well. They, 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 want to, they are there like to change the world, to have an impact. They, they would really like to for, 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 for a better world. And, and, and so this is what also is annoying with the greenwashing is because then the people who really mean well, want to do well, and there could be some people who help them along the route get, get crowded out in a sense by the, by the fake ones. Um, so, so, so all these insurance investors mean well, but usually they, they, they do have this, 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 uh, this, this problem like we mentioned earlier, that it's other people's money. And so uh, it, it's good you have good intentions, but at the end of the day, you're still playing with other people's money and that raises all kinds of very uh, difficult moral issues. For people where there is less moral issues, it's family offices, right? And we see a lot of young people in particular that, that uh, have a substantial wealth and really want to do well, and then they, they really want to have impact, et cetera. But typically, this, 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 a few of them are, are less well-educated uh, in terms of finance. And so I blame the intermediaries. We see a lot of intermediaries playing with that. I mean, the number of commercials I see that say, so, do you want to earn money and at the same time do good, invest in our mutual fund, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, you're not going to change anything. But like, of course, like who would say no to this app, okay? And so I, 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 then in that case for the people, you know, like ultimate asset owners, like the, the people whose money it is, like, like retail, including family offices, I'm, I'm, I'm blaming the intermediaries uh, and, and would like the regulators to go further. The European Union has done pretty well. They need to go further, but the other ones need to follow suit. Um, when you see the institutional investors, honestly, like these are the nicest people in any <laughs> conference or anything, the guys who are like uh, uh, focused on sustainability, they really want to do well, but they have limits of, of what fiduciary, uh, limits from the fiduciary obligation. So that's, that's quite different. Okay. The colleagues agree. Okay, well, maybe a few things about this. So the, this whole ESG movement and, and this explosion actually of funds that claim to be ESG, uh, I mean, th this is really the best marketing trick you can imagine, yeah? Uh, because there is a lot of buzz around ESG. Uh, it's opening opportunities. Uh, it's giving you additional insights and risks. ESG is typically a leading indicator for financial results. Okay, so that's that's also good. Um, and 
this is, um, I mean, history repeating itself. And uh, I've done, uh, when I was a PhD study uh, back in, in uh, the 90s, um, everybody was talking about uh, investing in internet companies, okay? And um, yeah, living in California, I mean, that, that was kind of uh, definitely the, the right thing to do. And, uh, and nothing mattered anymore in terms of governance or financial performance of these companies because you had to look at, okay, uh, the number of clicks they had and all these websites. And, and that, that was the, the whole thing to, to value these companies. It turned out that there was a massive um, yeah, uh, bubble and, and then we all know what's happened uh, afterwards. Uh, I think we are kind of currently observing that kind of, we are currently in that stage of ESG funds and, and companies claiming that they are really ESG and, and uh, promising all kinds of opportunities and so on. I mean, for sure, uh, DWS uh, is one of these cases, well, it was actually the first major case where uh, it was I mean, pretty clear that uh, it, it was not an ESG fund and, and they didn't mean that well, actually. So it was more a way to, to uh, label to attract uh, um, capital inflows. I mean, that, that's the, so I think that will clearly be happening in, in the coming years, actually, that, that uh, as long as we don't have clear definitions of and clear measurements, you will have these false claims and, and Ludovic, you actually also alluded to this. And, uh, it's really frustrating for funds who mean well that they are kind of uh, crowded out by uh, the, the, the brown companies or, or the brown funds uh, that, that, and the green washers. I mean, that's, that's too bad, but uh, it will evolve and, and eventually we will get there, but uh, it will take some time. Excellent. We have a last question coming in, but I see Christoph wants to, to well, add. Simply what I, I feel here that there seems to be a need for the legislator to step in to clarify a number of things and also to monitor those things so that actually there is less greenwashing going on and that the good guys that try to do their best can also pop up and that we eventually also as retail investors and the ones that are the beneficiaries can more or less also start to be able to identify who is good, who is bad. But that's a tremendously difficult thing. But at least we're trying also via legislation, may, maybe not always the best one, to go in that direction. Yeah, but then we, we managed to, to have a number of, of, of regulations that say that you, know, you cannot overpromise to investors on financial dimensions, right? You cannot, I cannot make an advertisement tomorrow saying, if you invest in my fund, you will become rich, right? I, I, it will be illegal. So why would it be illegal that I tell you, if you invest in my fund, you'll do well for the planet? How, why, no, right? So we, 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 the, the regulator, SEC and the like, uh, have a role to play uh, in, uh, in marketing, uh, regulating, regulating the marketing of products. We are in agreement with all those statements. We have a last question coming in. So I would like to uh, um, each of the participants give a little or a very short answer to the question, which is what does the panel think about the Banking for Impact Alliance who have developed the IMV, Impact for Measurement and valuation assuming that you know the initiative um do you want to comment on that it, it goes a little bit into this big three debate about whether banks do have impact or not on esg outcomes or esg behavior do we have an opinion on this alliance Christoph, both Philip. Yeah, well, Christoph, uh, you go first. <laughs> no, no, I wanted simply to say someone, hey, I'm a lawyer. I look at in particularly also legislation, so I'm less familiar. It's great, and I know some specificities of bankers that I know personally, what they try to do. But I'm, I'm not sufficiently informed about what exactly in this Banking for Impact Alliance is going on. I apologize. No. Yeah, so I wanted to make a similar statement. So I'm not uh, aware of that alliance, but I'm not surprised actually that you have these alliances, okay? Um, there is a lot of regulation um, uh, affecting the, the whole banking sector. And for sure, uh, you need to form alliances. And we've seen this actually again 20 years ago when I4S was introduced to all these new regulations on financial reporting. 
that, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, there was an alliance of Dutch companies uh, figuring out how to apply all these new rules. They sat together and then as, as uh, like a group of companies, they could have a way stronger position against the regulator. And, uh, so you have these alliances simply to figure out um, yeah, what these developments mean and, and how they need to implement it. So, uh, so I think it's good that you have these alliances in a way. Okay, thank you. Last question from my side. Um, and I would ask you to be very short and precise because we have one or two minutes remaining for the webinar. Uh, and it's a very simple question. What do you expect to be seen or um, to come in the next three to five years from a legal, Christoph, accounting, Philip, and maybe financial perspective, Ludovic, to finish the webinar? Christoph. I hope for some stability that we get a number of rules that can help us further and that first they are fully absorbed in society to see with what extent they help us forward to get indeed to, in several levels, a better ESG, a sustainable economy, whatever that might mean. And that once this has been clarified, meaning that everybody in the industry can cope with that, we then can take to and go to the next step because probably we will not be there. But I think the current road points in a good direction. Thank you, Christoph. Philip? Yeah, I mean, uh, I uh, definitely would say similar things uh, to, to Christoph. So what I see is that we are currently in a transition period, okay? And uh, it will take three to five years to get out of this transition period. So there will be a lot of uh, what I expect, um, uh, conflicts, greenwashing, scandals, um, uh, media attention, uh, all kinds of uh, things related to stakeholder groups that are very vocal about what companies are doing. So, so that's one thing uh, that we'll see. So that there will be a lot of fuzz about uh, this. Uh, but I see a very important role um, for certification. So the way to make ESG information more credible and useful in uh, markets is to certify it somehow. So there are huge investments being made now by, for example, the big four companies uh, to take over this whole certification role of sustainability um, information yeah? um, at the expense of maybe other market participants who, who can also do this uh, certification. And then maybe the last thing, and, and I mean, we are uh, after all university professors, uh, what I see as essential is that we start educating um, definitely our students on, on uh, sustainability and, and not like a separate course on sustainability, but integrate it in, in all the courses we have and let them think about this. Uh, but, and also as business schools, we, we can actually play a role in uh, educating also the, the, the older students or participants, uh, the, the people, um, in uh, the, the 40 or 50 year old uh, people who are from a different era, a different mindset, and, and who may be quite confused about uh, all the things that are happening right now. Excellent, thank you, Philippe. So last speaker, Ludovic, what do you expect to be seen in the next three to five years? And yeah, we, we, to we ESG? Time and, uh, so I'm not very good at uh, future <laughs> and the future. <laughs> I have uh, struggled enough with the past, so analyzing the past. But um, uh, yeah, no, I think the, the current trend will continue. I don't see any reason for why uh, they wouldn't continue. So, you know, there is more and more regulation coming in. Uh, there is uh, more and more people uh, trying to play that space or and pretending they're in that space, etc. There is a lot of thinking going there. All our students are obsessed with that space. And so, I, I, I see it continuing uh, on the current trend of, of growing better and better. And my only hope is that we manage to teach students to be a bit more rational and rigorous when they think about this question so that they don't uh, absorb uh, any BS that comes their way. So yeah, that's my uh, hope. Excellent, thank you. So I want to express my thanks uh, to the participants of this webinar, uh, especially Ludovic, which is kind of an outside institution, but still participates in our webinars at Tilburg. 
Uh, there was, this was a good op opportunity to, to cooperate across the boundaries of institutions to a topic that uh, touches basically everybody in the economy and which is uh, both timely and, 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 and focal. I want to thank uh, also Christoph uh, van der Els from uh, the law school and of course my colleague uh, Philip Jos uh, from Tilburg School of Economics and Management. I also wanted to thank uh, all participants who registered for the webinar. I, ha I hope you enjoyed the webinar as much as I did. I wish you all a very joyful evening, sustainable evening with maybe some follow-on discussions within the family. I hope to see you soon in our next webinar. Say thank you to everybody again. Have a good night. Thank you all and enjoy the evening. Bye.